Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Welcome back, Tan fans. Uh, and Father Robert Nixon, thank you for being here again. Thank you, Connor. It's an honor and privilege to be speaking to you today. Our, uh, we continue in our, in our short mini-series on the spiritual master of St. Anselm of Canterbury. And last episode, we had really an amazing overview of his, of his life, his biography, his works, how he's a great theologian, but more importantly, a great spiritual master and a devotional writer and his theology and devotion merge together harmoniously as they all should. And as really is, is the tradition with doctors of the church, they're not just great thinkers, but they're, they're holy people who see that the point of the mind is to help us raise it towards God and to change our daily lives. So we're going to jump in today on one of my favorite works that we now publish with you, The Passion of Christ Through the Eyes of Mary. And so we're going to dive deep into this. But if you could all uh, begin, as we always do, with a prayer uh, seeking the intercession of St. Anselm. Heavenly Father, you have given us your Son's passion as the supreme manifestation of your love and mercy. You have given us the Blessed Virgin Mary as the model of all grace, of every virtue, of all human perfection. We ask that through the intercession of St. Anselm, we may contemplate this wondrous passion through the eyes of Mary. We ask that you be with us in all our thoughts and words today. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Now, this this book, you know, I, I get the manuscripts early on. And by the way, it's beautifully designed. I'm very proud of that. But I get these manuscripts and I start flipping through it. And I'm always there's always a surprise in there. There's always a surprise. And, and it's um, one of the surprises in this volume is that it's actually, I guess, three different works put together. So we have something definitely from St. Anselm. Yep. And then something potentially from Bernard of Clairvaux, and then we have something called Our Lady's Lament. So why don't you just walk us through the structure of the book and where yeah. these different works come from? So, so these three works are all works from the uh, from the middle or late medieval period. They're all contemplating the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ through the perspective of Mary, and this was something which um, which became a practice about this time, about the time at which Saint Anselm and Saint Bernard lived. During that stage, there was a, an increased attention on the human sufferings of Christ. Not that it had been something which, which had been forgotten, but I guess had been emphasized a little bit less in the past when there was um, more emphasis on portraying Christ purely as, as a heroic or triumphant figure. Um, so various things caused people's hearts to be touched by this reawakened sense of Christ's human suffering and the great mystery of the Incarnation. And of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary is such an important figure, both as one who shared closely in the passion of Christ, in his pain, in his agony, and one who participated by her consent, by her maternity in the, uh, in the saving mystery of the Incarnation. So this work compiles three, work, uh, three, three pieces, the first of which is written by St. Edsel of Canterbury. It takes the form of a dialogue between St. Edsel and the Blessed Virgin Mary. And in this dialogue, he asks her about the passion of Christ and her experiences and her witnessing of it. And she relates to him. Um, the second work uh, attributed to St. Bernard, but scholars are not really sure if he actually wrote it or not. Um, it begins as a dialogue between St. Bernard and the Blessed Virgin Mary, and then continues as a narrative. Which doesn't really bother me. I mean, whether it's actually him or not, mm. would you say that with your experience with his certain works that it's in keeping with Well, it's very style? much in keeping with his, his uh, style, his spirituality, his focus upon the humanity of Christ. You know, and, and the thing is, of course, um, Bernardus was a very common name for monks back mm. in those days. Mm. So, so whether it was by Bernard of Clairvaux or another Bernard, no one can be absolutely certain. We should spend some time at, at some other 
point in the future on Bernard of Clairvaux. He, he's becoming quickly, you know, he's going up higher and higher on my list of favorite saints. You know, we publish yeah. a biography on him. And I think it's safe to say, we're not here to talk about him, but I'll just mention this in passing because I think it's awesome. He is probably the most influential man in the time in his time period that it was ever indeed, ever indeed. You know, his influence on kings. He settled a dispute among who the real pope was, yeah. and he was just this frail, quiet, soft spoken monk. But kings and popes bowed before him. It's unbelievable. They did. They did. Quite a, a phenomenal figure and, and would be frequently summoned from his monastery to do things, you know, to settle wars, to settle, you know, um, rivalries between different kings and rulers. And even on one occasion, as you mentioned, to to decide who was really the legitimate pope. Didn't he start the first crusade? He started, yeah. Um, was it the first crusade? I'm not sure which crusade, but he did definitely start a crusade. Yeah. Um, I mean, which, that's not on my resume. No, no, know? no. Well, I mean, <laughs> he's, 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 he's got an awesome <laughs> resume. He, he does. He does indeed. And, you know, in retrospect, looking at the, at the bloodshed and devastation which resulted from those crusades, uh, some people would say was it the right thing, but he certainly yeah, did you it. Live and learn. He did it um, with the spirit of that it was the, the right thing to do for yeah. the Christian faith at the time. Yeah, yeah. So a wonderful saint, and of course very important within the history of the Benedictine order. Yeah. So um, he lived. He was one of the earliest Cistercian monks, and the Cistercians are uh, kind of Benedictine. Yeah. They're reformed Benedictines. They were trying to. Um, to be more faithful to the original model of of the rule yeah. by incorporating manual labor into the daily life of of monks and um, by a certain a higher degree of asceticism at the time. Yeah, I'd say that at this point in time, though the the mainstream Benedictines and the Cistercians were were very close. They were all part of the same uh, one Benedictine family. Yeah. So yeah, and I could talk about Bernard forever, but we got to move on. And so so that's kind of the second part. Yeah, of the this second book. Part. And then the third the part third is part Our Lady's is, Lament. Is Our Lady's Lament, which was written by another Benedictine monk, uh, John Lydgate, who was an English Benedictine. He was uh, living in the 1300s. It was written originally, unlike the other two, which were both written originally in Latin, in Middle English. Hmm. So this was a different experience of translating yeah, a many, bet, yeah. uh, a bit Middle English text into, into kind of contemporary English. And so in the back here, there's little, there are very short meditations for every yeah bead on the rosary. There are. So I've included at the end what is called the uh, rosary of the seven sorrows of Mary, mm. sometimes called the servite rosary. So this rosary consists of, um, of uh, seven sets of seven Hail Marys mm. with uh, seven Our Fathers accompanying each one. And this includes uh, meditation for every one of those Hail Marys and also a listing of the various uh, Papal, the indulgences granted to uh, people who use this rosary by various popes. I mean, this book, this little book that we now publish with you, it's this is like the Swiss army knife of Mary's passion. I mean, it has a little bit of everything about the passion of Mary, you know, as she it, accompanied it is, Christ's it is, passion. So it is. A, the, the sorrows of Mary and, and the passion of Christ are so wonderfully presented here. And, and these works, amazingly, as it might seem, have not been available in modern editions until yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, it's the yeah. first time. This is what Tan Resurrection is doing, is resurrecting these things that have been lost to history. Yeah. You know, you're you're like Father Robert Nixon is like, uh, I guess, the Indiana Jones of great lost Catholic works. You know, <laughs> you, you know, you are saving these things and we're doing the easy part, which is just publishing them. But so we're going to jump in now to the text. And I think our listeners will hear exactly why this is such an amazing work. So it begins with the portrayal of Christ. And his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is like a dialogue, like, a it, you know, it says Anselm and then Mary and Anselm and Mary. And they're talking back and forth, right? Yeah. And But on the first page, I read something that blows my mind. Actually, I first read this. I was at Mass, and it was just like three minutes before Mass started. And it kind of <laughs> kind of distracted me the entire rest of the Mass. It was, a, it was an amazing little historical thing that whether it's true – doesn't really matter because it's just a beautiful yeah. metaphor. And it says this, Mary says <laughs> that the denarii, the, the, the silver, the 30 pieces of silver that they used uh, to pay Judas when he 
betrayed Christ in the garden were the same 30 pieces of silver that the Old Testament Joseph, his older brothers received when they sold him into slavery. And and there's a you have a footnote there about this. But why don't you why don't you tell us about yeah. how that 30 pieces of silver by legend you know, stayed in the treasury and made yeah. it all the way down to Judas. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so the story is that when um, when Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery, they received these thirty uh, silver denarii, and they were then preserved in the temple. Um, you know, uh, both as a historical point of thing, and because that they were, you know, there was something um, slightly sinister about these particular silver denarii, wow. which supposedly were 10 times the weight and value mm. of, of a regular denarii. Mm. And these were the same ones which they offered Judas for this act of betrayal. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. And I, <laughs> that's I think, such a powerful image. Uh, you know, whether whether that's true or not, it, 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 as you mentioned, it's not so important. It's part of a private revelation. So it's a kind of devotional thing. But I, I think there is... You know, it, it, it's remarkable to think that happens, and it puts into perspective also Judas' betrayal. Yeah, like we think the way that it's written about here is it was because he was actually filled with avarice that he actually wanted these, and otherwise we might think, well, thirty pieces of silver doesn't sound like very much, but but when you think about these were pieces of silver which were ten times the usual size. Yeah, so three hundred pieces of silver, indeed. you know, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it's just it's a powerful it's a powerful image, and um, in chapter two, um, on page eight, it talks about the arrest of Christ, and I found this fascinating. So we often hear a reference to um, the the brethren of Jesus, oh, you yeah. know, talking about James and, and John. John, and and you know we I guess we understand I guess most of us understand that that the word for brethren is the same as cousin. Yep. Um, and uh, our church teaches, of course, that that Mary didn't have any other children. But here it says, now there were, and this is Mary speaking, now there were two amongst those in the garden who were of very similar appearance, namely James and Jesus. That's right. For this reason, Judas said to the guards that the, the one, one that I, I kissed. Kiss. Well, yeah. that's right. And, you know, people who who hear the, the story of the passion, often I, I've wondered myself, why did Judas need to just like didn't they know who Jesus was? Yeah. Surely they would have known because he was, you know, a public figure. But this this kind of explains it. Yeah. That, it does. that Jesus and James were of almost identical appearance. It yeah. also makes a lot of sense of the reason why he was called the brother of Jesus, like yeah. the, the twin of Jesus. Yeah. So um yeah, so that that puts into context the significance of this kiss, why the kiss was needed to betray. To identify which one was really Jesus, that the Roman soldiers wouldn't have been able to distinguish the two. I, I love it. I love it. Um, yeah. So as we go on, you know, there's there's multiple places here where you know we're seeing something, Father, that's not in the Gospels, right? Yeah. And, and readers love this kind of thing. You know, we have a very popular TV series out there now called The Chosen. And it's it's about the apostles, but it's kind of the scenes. It's about the apostles and Christ, but it's the scenes between the gospel readings, you know. Oh, and yeah. so people enjoy kind of the creative license to say, okay, what yeah. might have been happening yeah, with yeah. Peter, you know, in but in between the lines of the gospels. Indeed, indeed. And I kind of feel like this book does that, but it it's, does. But it's from a saint, it, you know. It does. It's, just, it's from a saint, and you know, as I mentioned before, this is this is private revelation to Saint Ed, so. But a lot of these things also were um, were common beliefs or legends in circulation during the Middle Ages. Mm. I think one of the great uh, tragedies in the church scholarship in modern times is there's almost a deliberate attempt on the part of some scholars and translators to write out these kind of details. Yeah, you yeah. know, to think, well, this is not in Scripture, so we should leave it out. Um, one of the, I think, one of the problems with the modern breviary is it leaves out the lives of the saints. Mm. Saying that some of them are, are unhistorical or unproven, yeah. but I mean, you know, this is this is what gives color and substance. So yeah, I, I, love I, I love bringing this kind of stuff to to modern readers. I do, I do too. And so, <clears throat> all right. So on page fourteen, there's a great scene here where they're they are hearing 
Okay, it's talking about Mary Magdalene. Mary's telling Anselm. Mary Magdalene, meanwhile, was standing to and fro restlessly, wandering to and fro restlessly, seeking to see or hear what was taking place and striving to gain some knowledge of what was happening inside through the window. So this is a scene, sorry, I should have said, this is where Jesus is, uh, is, he, is he before, who is he standing before? Before the he's, high priest. Yeah, he's before the high priest. The high priest. And she, per chance, she happened to hear Peter's denials of Christ. Mm -hmm. How great was the sorrow and anxiety which pierced her heart when yeah. she heard those dreadful words, whereby the man who had been chosen as the leader of the disciple abandoned his beloved master. And then Mary says that she heard it herself. Like she, yeah. so and she made eye contact with Peter. Mm -hmm. And you have this, this, this scene yeah. where Peter, who was chosen to lead, these these the all the apostles, these women heard his denial. They did, and then he just runs. They, they did, they did. So you know, often um, one one of the things which I often wondered about until I translated this is what were what was Mary doing while Jesus was being questioned? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and the other disciples and Mary Magdalene, and um, it seems that they were all in close proximity. They yeah. were all you know trying to to hear and see what was going on. And of course they did, because how else would we know yeah, yeah. what happened, what right. transpired? And so it's recorded here in, in, in detail and um, Mary Magdalene's reaction, how she, you know, when she hears these denials, that she announces that she will never deny. Yeah. And, um, and, and similarly with Mary, the mother of Jesus, you know, and, and her great anguish, um, her anxiety, and her, her son is being here interrogated is in custody and she's doing her best to hear and see what's going on from the outside. Now tell us, you know, when he runs up, when Peter runs off, he goes somewhere. Tell us he about does, that. This is does. cool. This is very cool. So, you know, um, we read only in the gospel that he hears the cock crow and then he goes and weeps bitterly. This gives us an extra detail. He goes and conceals himself in this rock and um, remains there until after the resurrection. The name of this rock is uh, Gallicantus, which means in Latin, the uh, the crow uh, of a cock, hmm. of a rooster. And um, interestingly enough, there is actually this rock, this Gallicantus rock, still in existence. Hmm. And there's a little monastery there. And I never realized that's what the tradition is, that that was the rock where Peter hid himself wow. after the until after the resurrection. Wow! Yeah, yeah that's it's it's that's very cool. It's very cool. Now, the next chapter, Christ has led to Caiaphas, and here Anselm asks Mary an interesting question. In fact, he asks her multiple times through this. He says. Did you have any hope, Mary, that Jesus might be liberated from his plight? <laughs> you know, he's like, yeah. did you think at this point that he might get out of this mess? Yeah. It's a very human, normal question to ask. It is. And, and she answers a, a couple different times. She definitely did. She was hopeful that uh, Jesus would get out of this. And she says, for I knew that he was eloquent in speech and extremely intelli intelligent. I therefore certainly hoped that he could defend himself convincingly against any judge. But when he came before his judge, he stood like a gentle lamb before his slaughter, not opening his mouth. I just, I think it's a very uh, endearing thing where this mother yeah. is saying, my son, not just that he's God, <laughs> he could snap his finger and solve this, yep. but he's going to talk his way out of this because he can. Yeah. Yeah. But he doesn't, and she has to witness him being that sacrificial lamb. And it must have been registering with her, oh, he really is the lamb of God. Yeah, yeah. So, of course, you know, Mary uh, understood that, that Jesus was destined to suffer for the salvation of the world, but she didn't know the precise occasion when when this was going to happen or how it was going to happen or anything. So, of course, she, she was still very hopeful that he was going to be liberated. And as you mentioned, um, she knew that he was such a, a powerful, eloquent, intelligent speaker. She was. She felt that yeah, he'll he'll speak to the uh, he'll speak and he'll defend himself. Yeah, and indeed, as he had in the past on s several other occasions. Yeah, he was ev evidently very convincing. And I think when we think about Christ, this is something we can overlook. He was really the. Um, the most effective public speaker of all time. Yeah, yeah. You know, he spoke to these enormous crowds without the benefit of a microphone yeah. and, and converted people just with a few words. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he didn't always need the miracles to do it. You no. Know? But uh, uh, that's a good segue, the need for miracles to convert people. Um, in chapter 6, Jesus is brought before Herod. Oh, uh, yes. And returned to Pilate. So I'm on page 23. This is interesting. This is where I love this private revelation stuff and the history and the tradition because we find things that I certainly had never thought about, never heard about. And so it says here that Herod implored him to give some display of his marvelous power. So again, this is this is so cool. Um, actually, oh, let me go back. There's this interesting point where Herod asks Mary, again, Mary's telling Anselm this, right? And Herod asks Jesus, are you the one that my father tried to kill when you were a baby? Yeah. How interesting a question. I mean, it, it makes perfect sense that he would have asked him. That. Well, well, that's right. And, and the, and the um, story about this prophecy of this king who was to emerge, um, and Herod uh, Sr. had uh, had slaughtered the innocents as yeah. a result of that. But but certainly the um, the prophecy was still in existence and something which, which Herod the Herod who lived at the time of the Passion was was aware of. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and yeah. so wondering if this if this emerging leader is the one who has been foretold, and we see the attitude of Herod here as one of great curiosity. You know, he really wants to see a miracle to to see if this this guy who's got such an immense reputation to see if he's for real to witness it for for himself. So, in trying to entice Jesus, yeah, to do a miracle. He crowns him. Herod even placed a crown upon his head, earnestly pledging to make him a share of his royal power and equal co-heir to the throne. If only he would perform a miracle for him. Is That's an amazing thing. And it, it you it can't is. read that and not think it, about it, his temptation it, by Satan in the it, desert. It, it is, it is, it is. And, you know, I think uh, Herod in this case is thinking, here is the emerging king. Here is the one who has been foretold to be the king of Israel. Which he would know about. I mean, Which he's he got to be about. educated I mean, in the prophecies. Indeed. And, and you know, he has an immense number of followers. So I think Herod is thinking, if I can make this person a, a co-ruler with myself, I can protect my own position. Oh, that's was, awesome. You see, that's, that's a really cool insight because – He's. It's not so much that Herod's looking for the king to to follow. He's probably trying to protect his own. Yeah, you yeah. Know, his own reputation oh, yes. by kind of. He wants to use Christ's reputation as to, to protect to, to, himself. To and this is something which happened on a few occasions in the Roman Empire, where mm. where there'd be a rival, and so there would be a appointed co-emperor. Yeah. So the idea was to make uh, Jesus a partner in his own rule. And Jesus is just like not having anything to do no, with this. No. He's like. Uh, I'm not playing this no, game. No, that you don't understand it completely. That he's, you know, his his kingdom is not of this world. So it don't work, right? No. And Herod's pissed off about he this. He is, and so so then Mary explains to Anselm on the next page. He says, and on that very day, Herod and Pilate, who had hitherto been enemies, became firm friends. I mean, I just it it's the it's the story. It's just the it's the story of what happens in feuds. Oh, yeah. And so Herod and Pilate. Now, hey, they're buddy buddy from here on well, out. Well, that's right. And one thing she mentions is that Herod also hoped to spare him after this interview. Mm. You know um, that he had, you know, this this kind of sense that this is someone who, his great dignity, um, worth, and everything, that he doesn't want to condemn him. And right. so, for this reason, sends him to Pilate as his kind of own way of washing his hands of the matter. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So they were both kind of washing their hands of it. They both had a sense, I don't think we should kill this guy. Yeah. But they also lacked the they lack la they, they lack the moral fortitude to right. stand up to the to the crowd. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. All right. So uh, it's just incredible. I'm just kind of flipping through here. One another sentence uh that really struck me, Father, on paragraph, I'm sorry, uh chapter seven. We've moved on to the crowning, the scourging and crowning with thorns. And, you know, Mary is quite uh, descriptive here, and she's explaining on, on page 27 how, you know, he Jesus was such a, a good-looking man. He was so a, attractive to people. But after the scourging and after the crowning of thorns, she says, he looked as if he was horribly deformed and stupefied, like one consumed by leprosy. Like his skin yeah. had been so destroyed that he looked like he had leprosy. It's just a description I've never heard before. Yeah, yeah. And you can imagine how how shocking that would have been for for any mother to see 
their, their beloved son in such a state. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, on, on chapter 10, the crucifixion, um, page 35, Mary says, Here, Anselm, I shall tell you. What I have to relate is profoundly lamentable and of infinite bitterness, and none of the evangelists have recorded these dreadful things in the sacred pages of their holy books. So she's going to be telling us stuff that the evangelists... Indeed, indeed. I mean, they just, the Gospels each say that he was he was crucified. They don't give any details yeah. about how exactly what happened and what that involves. And so, you know, she gives a, some, a little bit interesting context. So Calvary, which we just think of as like a hill with a cross on it, a wretched and deplorable place where carcasses of dogs and the corpuses of beggars and lepers are discarded. And they stripped my son of all his clothing, leaving him completely exposed. Now, this is an interesting point I wanted to mention. You know, I, I would, I have often thought that part of the, the horror of the crucifixion was the shame of being stripped down naked. I mean, why in the world would the Roman guards, you know, allow a guy who they're crucifying to maintain some level of, you know, modesty or whatever. Um, so this, this is a beautiful notion to me, uh, leaving him completely exposed. I myself, we're talking about Mary now saying this, I myself, as I looked on, felt barely alive, so weakened was I with horror and shock. Nevertheless, I took the veil which I wore on my head and wrapped it around his waist to provide him with some covering for the sake of modesty. Yeah, That's a beautiful it notion. Is, First is. of all, women shouldn't have been exposing their hair, so she was probably – doing something that was risky anyway, you know, yeah. for herself. But she took this veil off and wrapped it around his waist. It was a very yeah. motherly, a very tender thing to do it, for her son. It is, it is, it is, yeah. And, you know, I think that makes sense too because we always see uh, Jesus crucified. He has that uh, that cloth around his yeah. loins. And, you know, that's very ancient tradition. So I think that this is very unbelievable and understandable. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, the, that chapter concludes with something I just, I just, this is interesting. She says that the cross was raised up. It was of such a height that I was not able to touch his feet. That's a very different picture yeah. than I've then seen we, on TV. We, yeah. We normally you know. imagine it not being so tall, but yeah. you know, yeah. And, um, the, the, that it was very, very high. And I think that makes sense, you know, because it was designed to be very visible. Very visible for everybody in town. There, yeah. And, so and it was a, like an enormous thing. And, and you know, I think this is actually consistent with what we hear about the cross in uh, St. Helena's discovery of it. Oh, it's, yeah. It's great size. Yeah, it was huge. It was huge. Um, Constantine's mother. Yeah. Right, who that's, went that's, to the Holy Land to find the cross. Indeed. So another interesting point here is she says when he was – crucified, laying on the ground. They nailed him down. He didn't actually bleed a lot because the 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 nails were it's, so large yeah, that it just kind of still filled, filled filling up the, the wounds. Filling yeah, the wounds. Yeah. But then when they raised it up and it went up, then his body, the gravity of his body, the weight of his body, boom, went down on the spikes. Yeah. That uh, and once he was raised up because of the weight of his suspended body, all of his wounds burst open. Blood flowed forth in copious torrents from his hands and feet. At that time, this is this is a this is a powerful image. I mean, this is, I think it is, and I've never seen a movie depict this. She says, at the time, I was wearing a kind of white sheet, as was the custom for religious women, which covered my head and my entire body. And as I stood at the foot of the cross, this pure white garment became saturated with the streams of crimson blood, which gushed from his precious body. Indeed, some powerful it stuff is, right there. Is. You know. Yeah. So the book goes on. Um, the, it, it, it briefly talks about the the last words of Christ, which we're going to talk about at another point in Bonaventure because you've done yeah. a, you've done a, a translation on the original seven last words of Christ by Saint Bonaventure. So we're going to that's a whole nother conversation. But she does touch on a few of those last words that Christ spoke from the cross. But I wanted to zoom in on one thing. On page forty-two, the very last, the very last uh, uh, line on that page, and we're going again. We're going to talk about this some point when we talk about Bonaventure. This is powerful. She she does mention that he said, "It is consummated." Now, 
we often hear in our translations, the NABRE translation and the RSV, it is finished, it is ended. Yeah. But the Dewey Reams, which is Tan's, you know, translation and our my favorite translation, it is consummated. So I just oh, thought it was yeah. worth talking about how that particular translation, which is much more literal from the Latin Vulgate, yep, yep. then it is finished. And Indeed. finished and consummated are two it, very it, different it, concepts. It is, it is. So I, you, yeah. you use that translation. And so I just thought here just a, yeah. a minute or two on what this this means to you. It is yeah. consummated. So, you know, consummated implies the fulfillment of, of, uh, of this great mission, of this great work. You know, and it also implies a union. We often use, I guess, the most common usage of the word consummated today is in relation to marriage. You have to consummate your, ma your marriage. That, that, yeah. that, that this kind of is not not a finish, but a, a, a drawing to completion, which mm -hmm. which in a way is a glorious uh, beginning. So, so I think, yeah, this translation, it is consummated. And, you know, I hadn't realized, I always assumed that was the same translation as in um, – the uh, Dewey Reeves, as in the King no. James version, as in the the Wycliffe version, but I checked out mm. all these older versions as well because there are lots of uh, English translations which you know far precede yes. the King James and everything. Yeah. And it, yeah, it seems it's unique yeah. to the Dewey Reeves, which I think is to its great credit. It is. It's because Saint Jerome, a doctor of the Church, understood. The, the significance of this word. And I think the other translators perhaps did not. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's his word. I mean, he's choosing, well, it's the Latin Vulgate, I guess, but I mean, he is the Latin, was the King James coming from the Latin Vulgate? It was, it okay. was. Okay. Okay. But, so but, for, but okay. for some odd reason, the, the English James translators aren't changed aren't it to, uh, to it is finished or it is done. Yeah. Which uh, is, there are a few inexplicable things in the King James where they seem deliberately to change the, the, the meaning of the Latin words. Yeah. It's interesting. And it's just such a, a much more complete word because it's it's the fulfillment of all the Old Testament yeah. prophecies, and it's the it's the completion of Christ's relationship with the church. Yeah. So everything is good to go from here on. It's it's almost like not an ending. It's almost a beginning. It is. You know? It is. It is. Yeah. So it's a consummation of of, of the glory of, of of God's mission and the consummation of this mystical union yeah. between Christ and the church and between divine nature and human nature. Yeah. You know, I think Jerome was pretty clear that it was supposed to be consummation. I don't know why people mess yeah. with that. But nonetheless, um, one thing that I'll just I'll just mention here, this was a very cool scene on page 44. She, Mary says, after this, he bowed his head. So this is after he said it's consummated, he's died. And he says, he bowed his head, gave up his spirit. Then the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top and the bottom. We know that. The earth shook and the stones were torn apart. This was particularly the case with the large boulder upon which the cross itself stood. It yeah. was rent apart in such a way as to leave an opening large enough to insert a hand into. So like the whole cra the, gr the ground just breaks. Tombs also opened up and many of the bodies of the saints who rested within rose from the dead. Following the resurrection of my son, Many of these saints went out from their tombs and entered the holy city, where there were seen where they were seen by many. Oh, that is it is <laughs> that's a crazy it, scene. It is it is, and in fact, the 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 resurrection of of the other dead from their tombs is something which is mentioned only very briefly in the Gospel of Matthew. You know, but but if you think about it, that's a completely amazing thing to, yeah. that it must have been really, you know, I, I guess something which anyone who was present at the time must have been overawed by these things which were going on, not only the eclipse of the sun, these rocks splitting open, tombs opening up. Yeah. So another beautiful thing that kind of goes through this book, and I didn't realize it until I got about halfway through, but I realized that at m many occasions she re she refers to uh, the prophecy of Simeon about the sword piercing her heart. Yeah. And it turns out, she says it seven times. She does. Right? She yeah. does. And in fact, in each of these works, there's reference to that uh, sword of sorrow, which Simeon had predicted. And in each time, it's it's seven. So the the tradition of the seven sorrows of Mary was was one which um this extends back to to this time. Another thing that I had never heard of, which I hope is true, because it's just incredible. Page fifty two, Father. 
this is when this is really the pieta, like when the body of Christ is taken down from the cross. And it says, all the disciples came and mourned deeply over the death of their master. But then it came about that the body of my deceased son was miraculously restored. What immense consolation it brought to me and all his disciples. In this glorified body, there were no wounds or scars to be seen except for the five scars of the sacred wounds of his crucifixion. And these five wounds are destined to remain visible on his body until the final day of judgment. But apart from these, his body appeared entirely healthy as if he had never undergone the ordeal of his passion. Yeah, this is amazing, isn't it? And, you know, we're, we're told that when Christ uh, appears in his resurrected form, he still bears the wounds. Yeah. But to think all the other wounds, all the other uh, injuries which he was suffered were were miraculously healed. And I guess, you know, it was a divine body, so by by its nature it couldn't be in this um, in this wretched state after death. So, and, and she mentions how much consolation she she gets from this fact that she he got is, a, yeah, she, yeah she got a lot of consolation but then they have to put him in the tomb and she, and it's she like, does and, and she doesn't want and to she no want to no it. i mean this is something which appears in all three narratives that she really doesn't want him to be taken from her embrace yeah they almost have to uh, to to forcibly yeah take him from and john arms. who's now the caregiver for her you know mary says to anselm john yeah. knew i knew i had to let go she john yeah. basically forced her yeah. to go back home yeah. Yeah. they had to pry his body out of her hands yeah. essentially that's what happens but isn't that what would happen with any mother like is, you know your is, kid dies in the hospital yeah you, you have to pry the mother it away is, you know is, and yeah. so that we shouldn't be surprised that was the case but it's a beautiful it is it is uh, it revelation is. Yeah, that, very that he very had. heartbreaking to think of what that was like for her so, you know, this this book, remarkable. Um, I could go on and on, but we kind of skimmed the kind of skimmed the surface of Anselm's revelations from the Blessed Mother. Um, it gave gave me so much insight into the passion that I, I had never had before. I mean, I just I love this. Um, and to our listeners, I mean, if you heard anything that was interesting, trust me, it's <laughs> every paragraph is 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 interesting. We're just skimming the surface. So, I mean, Father, any any kind of last thoughts on your experience working on this, or any advice to our potential readers uh, of what they can get out of this tremendous work for yeah. their own spiritual formation? Yeah, you know, I I really think this would be uh, a, is a tremendous work for people to read who are wanting to meditate upon the passion of Christ, you know, and uh, the Gospels are great for that, of course, but this provides so much more more detail, so many heart-rending details, as we've, we've just discussed a few of them, and there are many more which we haven't talked about. And, and what's more, this is not just um, anyone imagining these things. This is one of the great doctors and saints of the church, St. Anselm of Canterbury, which he experienced in this in this wonderful vision. And, um, you know, it's such a, a privilege for me to bring this otherwise lost and neglected work to light. And uh, it's a kind of work where there are references to it in other books. They say, oh, well, there's the, you know, St. Anselm's dialogue, but they, they, there's none of the actual details. So until now, it's been almost uh, under a cloak of of oblivion. So so thanks to uh, Connor, thanks to Ted Books, it's um, – it's a privilege to be able to bring this to contemporary readers. It's been a privilege. And our next episode, we're going to talk about St. Anselm's other amazing work, the glories of heaven, the supernatural gifts that await body and soul in paradise. And uh, we're going to be talking about what the what our glorified body is able to do in heaven. So I'm really excited about getting to that. But thank you, Father, for all your work, for translating this. Again, I've said it many times, you're not just a translator, but you're you're, you're a poet. And you put you put your own passion into the translation of this. It comes out beautiful. Um, this is a work of art and a spiritual work uh, that, that you know that, that you're doing for the, the the church and all of our customers. So I'm very grateful. Thank you for Thank being you, here Connor. and God bless you. Thank you, Cotter. God bless. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to get special offers exclusive to Spiritual Masters listeners, sign up at spiritualmasterspodcast.com. And thanks for listening.